Thank you, everyone. I've got a lot to tell you this evening. I hope I don't put you to sleep, though. So I'll start off with a short uh, video, really, from, um, well, one of my ladder climbs. Had the lights down. Good. Feeling very lethargic up here. It's really very difficult to do anything. All you want to do is lie down, even that's hard work. You really need to motivate yourself. You've got to have severe dis discipline in order to even just get by up here. He speaks from the death zone. He is alone, filming himself. A camera between his upraised knees. Uh, this evening around 9 p.m. I'm going to try and set off for the summit. The summit is still some 3,000 feet above him. The sea, where his climb began, some 26,000 feet below. He is near the end of a long, long road. flattest continent. He trains for towering mountains. In sweltering heat, he steals himself for snow. From this unlikely place, this gold mining region of Australia's west, comes this unlikely giant of the mountain road. So I did, I wanted the cameraman to, um, and the truck driver to collude with me. I was going to be running along, the truck would come along and uh, appear to run over me. I mean, they're so high, they could easily just duck down and run over you, but um, I didn't manage to convince them. Anyway, I used to live in the uh, gold fields of Western Australia for a while, and I, I was indeed training for my Caesar Summit expedition then, but. Uh, before that, I grew up in uh, northeast of Victoria, well, my teenage years. But I, life for me, or to, to paraphrase a couple of varying sources, um, my family, well, my parents had a farm in Africa. So for me, it began in Africa. Uh, I spent the uh, first 12 years of my life there. Very fortunate, really, to be in that part of the world at that time. I think it probably did uh, result in me having uh, a sense of adventure, just living in, in an isolated part of the world like that. Really, for all intents and purposes, it was quite, you know, it was a third world country. My, my parents were farming organically, actually, which was uh, pretty well, well the only way you could do it back then, but quite successfully. And for me, looking to the horizon was always a very exciting thing because, well, what was over the horizon? just wilderness. And I'd always imagine myself climbing to any hill, the top of any hill to see what was over the horizon. I was sent to school when I was eight, two day drive to the north of the country. And each day in my classroom, I'd find myself gazing out the window at this four and a half thousand meter volcano called Mount Meru. And when the weather was clear, I could look a little bit further afield and see Africa's highest peak, Kilimanjaro. And of course, like most young people, I, I wonder what it'd be like on the summit, and I always dreamed of getting there, but I was never given the opportunity because, well, mainly for political reasons, we ended up leaving Australia and coming to my father's native country, uh, leaving Africa and coming to my father's native Australia, where we settled in, in the Northeast. And eventually I won a scholarship to Geelong Grammar School which my father had been to in the early part of last century. Um, anyway, it was a stroke of luck for me because the school had a, a campus, Timbertop, where I really discovered my uh, passion, I guess. Um, you know, every, after a little bit of training, every Friday afternoon, we could just walk out the school gates and not be expected back until Sunday evening. As 15-year-olds, well, we did get up some mischief as well, but, which was unofficial, but 
it was a tremendous experience to be given the responsibility of looking after yourself at that age and, well, to also suffer the consequences of any mistakes that you made. Fortunately, we didn't make too many, but uh, I really, after, well, after the initial sort of breaking in period where you hated walking up hills and you developed uh, sufficiently sort of, um, well, your muscles developed so that you could actually get up hills without too much pain, uh, the challenge of walking through this wild la landscape became a real passion. And that passion for me continued even into my university years. I chose my place of university, Canberra, because it was close to the mountains. Uh, in the wintertime, I discovered cross-country skiing, really as an alternative to, well, I, I love skiing, but it was too expensive. So cross-country skiing was being, once you had the gear, it was really pretty well, very, very cheap activity. But the winter landscape is much wilder and, well, I suppose this, that draw, drew me into um, thinking about mountaineering. And I joined the climbing club at university. From there, well, of course, obviously, rock climbing. You don't go mountaineering in Australia. But my friends would um, teach me the, the techniques. And being students, some of us started making our own gear. I got into big wall climbing by going to Mount Buffalo, which is uh, very intimidating, climbing up a thousand foot wall, always dreaming of, of uh, the greater um, venues such as Yosemite and uh, perhaps even the Alps. People in the club would go to New Zealand in the summertime. And so I thought, well, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a go. Uh, I managed to save up enough money from being a builder's labourer. It was back in that, those days, due to Gough Whitland's largesse, we also got tertiary allowance. And um, I'm sort of ashamed to say this now, but I, I actually managed to save up enough in my tertiary allowance to pay for my ticket to go to New Zealand. Maybe I was, I was a very spendthrift student. Anyway, that's where the closest mountaineering is to Australia. It's a mountaineering you need, glaciated mountains. And it's a very good venue for mountaineering, very challenging, more, more challenging than the Alps actually because uh, there's less infrastructure in, in the New Zealand mountains. There's a few huts, but there's no cable cars. And well, the thought of rescue was, you know, it's not, not nearly as sophisticated as the Alps. Eventually, I, of course, the highest mountain in New Zealand is Mount Cook. So I, I got enough experience after a couple of summers to consider attempting Mount Cook and by this stage I'd teamed up with a chap called Lincoln Hall who seemed to be a similar ability to me and similar ambition and we decided to have a bit of an adventure on Mount Cook so we, we thought we'd do a multi-day uh, trip by climbing up this peak here which is called Nozomi and then going up the south ridge of, of Mount Cook which was coincidentally climbed by Ed Hillary back in the early 50s. <laughs> Climbing for, for me was really just a, uh, it was an extension of walking that I'd done in Timbertop. So you set yourself a challenge of doing a, a route and uh, went out and, and, and did it in, in a, as good a style as possible. Self-supporting, carrying everything on your back. And at that stage, our club had been planning, uh, was in the sort of nascent period of planning an expedition to the Himalaya, which had not really done thing back then. Hardly any Australians ever went to the Himalaya, even just to go walking, let alone climbing. And so this uh, excavator, Mark Cook, that Lincoln and I were participating in was, was really a practice run for an, uh, this upcoming expedition. I wasn't sure whether I'd really have the, uh, well, the resources, <laughs> the money to go on it or the experience. But, um, well, we ended up having to dig ourselves, actually we'd, we'd planned to just bivy out, but a storm came in, which was um, the storm in the South Island of New Zealand is, can be quite serious on, on the high mountains, because out here you can see the, the Southern Ocean. So the, the cl mountains are very close to the sea and, and it, they cop a lot of weather. So another reason why New Zealand's such a good training ground for the greater ranges. But having ski toured, 
knowing snow caves were a good form of shelter, we survived the storm very well, actually. There was a, um, a search plane came out after the storm looking for us and saw us climbing up the, uh, to the top of Cook and, and uh, it, it, the search was called off because it looked like we were okay. But it was actually a pivotal experience in what was later to happen. So our club did um, get this trip together and eventually I considered, well, I, I probably did have enough experience, so um, <laughs> it was a stroke of luck. I had a job for the Forestry Commission here, summer job, because I was part of my studies in biology was, was, was forestry. And so I, I had a job up in the Victorian Alps near Mansfield doing some uh, alpine ash regrowth survey. Perfect job training for a, an expedition because it involved uh, going to random areas in the Alps with a, an ax, uh, chopping down a tree, counting the, how, how the growth rings to um, confirm that it was a regrowth of the 1939 fire, fires and then walking out again. Uh, towards the end of the stint of that job, uh, there were a series of dry lightning strikes through the Alps and uh, all these fires started up. So we were sent out to uh, fight the fires. Um, because we were on, on the payroll, um, and these were 18 hour days, we, we earned an enormous amount of overtime. I felt very guilty uh, fighting alongside, you know, farmers from Gippsland who, who were volunteers. Anyway, I got enough money to go to, to, on this expedition. So uh, the Himalaya, of course, uh, part of that great southern uh, arc of mountains on, on the southern edge of the Tibetan Plateau. And we had chosen to go to a mountain in the Indian Himalaya the mountain's called Dhanagiri, and it was a 7,000 metre peak. Really um, a bit ambitious for people of our level of experience. I mean, there are other climbers who are more experienced than Lincoln and I, but anyone who goes to altitude, I, I would say in retrospect, try a 6,000 metre peak first just to see whether you like altitude and just to learn what it's all about, because actually it's a very different environment up there. Anyway, if you survive, that's, that's the mountain we've come to climb, Dunagiri. And we should have been trying something much lower, but uh, providing you survive the experience, well, you can learn a lot from uh, jumping in at the deep end. And certainly, coming from Australia, well, Africa is now a bit of a distant memory, but you know, this is the flattest continent on Earth. Going to the Himalaya was mind boggling. I suppose um, it. it it brings, uh, it puts new meaning to the word majesty. Uh, you know, they're, um, those mountains are, are, are totally on a different scale. You know, I remember looking as we were driving up the, one of the headwaters of the Ganges, looking at the head of the valley at these rising thunder heads, and then realizing that the tops of these thunder heads were rather angular, and that angularity was due to the fact that they were, well, it was part of the earth, not the thunder heads were actually below the tops of the mountains the high mountains. When you get to the roadhead on an expedition, you employ porters, and uh, that's part of the experience. You get to meet the local people and be with them for a couple of weeks as you walk in to base camp. The route into our base camp was had a historical significance because it had been, uh, well, quite a, an interesting uh, venue for exploration back in the early part of the last century, because at the head of the valley was India's highest peak, Nanda Devi. And British explorer mountaineers had for years tried to figure out the puzzle of how, how to get into the base of Nanda Devi up this gorge known as the Rishi Gorge. And we were going up the initial parts of the Rishi Gorge before turning left, before getting into the main sanctuary. Uh, tough going, a lot of the way we had to actually build bridges even along cliff sides, uh, crossing the river several times. And eventually we left the gorge and climbed out up into the snow. And even at 4,000 metres, three and a half thousand metres, still in the forest, the effects of altitude start to become uh, known to us. You can, any amount of reading will not prepare you for the devastation that occurs with, with altitude. The, 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 mainly is, well, physically of course, but psychologically is a real blow because especially at that age, you know, you, un, you think you're unstoppable, yet lack of oxygen, even half the level of oxygen in the atmosphere stops you in your tracks. Uh, when you first get to altitude, it's really like having a bad hangover. 
you feel nauseous, you've got a constant headache, you lose your appetite, and you generally feel incredibly lethargic, so that I couldn't, couldn't imagine how it was possible to go much higher than base camp when I first got there. Anyway, reading had taught us that you do acclimatise, and it also, I'd, I'd sort of understood that uh, you really need to push yourself a little bit, but not too much, and it was good to go up and then come back down again. So with that idea in mind, I convinced Lincoln, who was going to be my climbing partner, that um, we should uh, split off from the main group who were just ferrying loads up to the bottom of our main objective, Dunagiri. Um, initially, we planned climbing a, a new route on Dunagiri, steep, the steep side of it, but on, well, experiencing firsthand the effects of altitude, we quickly changed <coughs> our plans to try and climb a, an easier way up this left-hand ridge. They still hadn't had many successful ascents, so you know, an ascent would have been very significant. But to get acclimatised, I convinced Lincoln that we should um, go over here and try and climb this peak first. It was unclimbed, which for climbers is that's a major attraction. Uh, going somewhere where no one else has been before, you have to figure everything out yourself, and uh, you know it's obviously a very satisfying to climb something that no one's climbed before. So with that as our inspiration, and also to get, get a bit acclimatised, we headed up to the foot of that climb, spent a night at the base of the wall, and then had an awful alpine start. The worst thing about mountaineering is having to have an alpine start. I mean, you do have to get up early, get going before the sun comes, because the lower parts of the mountain tend to uh, be snow covered, and that snow freezes nice and hard overnight, and during the day, or very quickly, once the sun comes up, especially here because the, you know, it's very close to the equator, so the sun's quite strong, uh, the snow, the hard crust on the top melts and you sink into it, making it very hard going. So the idea is to get over those initial slopes quickly, well onto the route before the uh, sun softens the snow. And you get more avalanche danger lower down. So we had to get up around 3 a.m horrible thing to do when it's cold. But by midday, we were finding ourselves in a very spectacular position, looking out the horizon, opening out before our eyes, just a gobsmacking view. You looked in every direction, there's mountains just stretching to the horizon. And, well, even back then I knew that half of those peaks had no names, and a lot of them were unclimbed. After going along the ridge for a little bit, going got too difficult, so we were forced out onto the north face, which uh, was a bit in the shade, and as a result, uh, the ice was quite hard. Generally, that's good, but then the ice got really hard and brittle. When you climb ice, you have, uh, well, you're using your crampons, which are spikes which are strapped to your, your boots, and then you've got two, two tools, your ice, well, they're basically two picks, they're called ice axes, or ice hammer and ice axe, and you use them for purchase. Sounds all very straightforward because surely you just, you know, um, whack your tools in and you get a good purchase and you just, you just use them as hand holes and foot holes. That, that's the theory, but the problem is ice uh, varies a lot. When it gets very cold like this, uh, it becomes brittle. So uh, if you don't hit hard enough, your tools just bounce off. If you hit too hard, it shatters and you get no purchase. So you've got to find the, just, just the right momentum for your tool to, to get it to stick. It gets quite spicy. Um, to stop yourself from falling, you put in, uh, hopefully put in ice crews along the way, but the ice was so hard that our very basic gear that we had, the climbing gear has gotten a lot better, but the ice crews that we had were, were, weren't that good metal and they would tend to break. So we broke, after breaking a couple, Lincoln got to me here and it was a very spectacular situation. It was, you know, debating whether to go on. We, we, we're starting to feel a bit strange. And I said, well, come on, Lincoln, we better get going. And he said, oh, look, I can't work out how to use my camera. I said, oh, that's a problem. Actually, <laughs> I'm having trouble thinking too. Maybe we should head down. <laughs> Luckily, we headed down. Because the altitude was starting to affect our ability to think and getting hypoxia in the brain. Um, probably uh, a bit of edema in the brain, actually, which um, one of the effects of altitude is that your cells become leaky and, um, well, it, 
it's a problem in your head if um, you start having leaky tissue, brain tissue, because that fluid's got nowhere to go because the brain is uh, encased in the skull. And so you start getting a very bad headache and not thinking straight. So we descended, got hit by a storm. Luckily, we were pretty well equipped. So we managed to survive the night okay. Um, we had a stove. We didn't have a tent, but we had big bags and so on. Anyway, the next day was one of the hardest things I'd, we'd, but either of us had ever done up until that point because our heads were just absolutely uh, owning. The pain in our head was just owning our whole being and, and it would have been very easy to make a mistake. We got off the mountain by the skin of our teeth, staggered back down to base camp to discover the others were, you know. <laughs> no, actually they had been um, you know, taking loads up on to the bottom of the, the main objective and now they're having a bit of a rest. But they should have known better than doing this. That was our doctor there. He, he, he definitely should have known better um, because, you know, the, the atmosphere is actually very thin. We're, we're only just under five kilometres above sea level here. So, you know, it's got you know, probably more than half the density atmosphere is still above you. But that, ha that half amount of air makes a huge difference to the strength of the sun and for years now I've had I've been having you know going have skin cancer checks and I'm always having stuff burnt off my the backs of my hands and off my face I think mainly it's from high my exposure to high altitude although as a kid I never used to use sunscreen so you never know anyway it's, it's bad the sun up there is really bad um, so we turned our attention to our main objective and really it was yeah, it's much, much harder than we expected. Just, just being at altitude, even if it had been a straightforward snow slope, it was going to be very, very hard work. Of course, it wasn't a straightforward snow slope. There was quite a, uh, a steep um, step at the beginning of the route. And so we decided that uh, to make things a bit safer, we would use all the rope we bought to fix a line of, uh, uh, put a line of fixed ropes up this initial step. Now that's kind of a old fashioned way of climbing. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't particularly like having to fix ropes, but I understood that it would improve our chances. The problem with fixing ropes is, you know, the rope actually is quite heavy, and the, and you've got to fix it to the mountain. The, the gear is quite heavy, and it's very tedious. You can only do it, in, you know, when the weather's good, because when the weather's bad, you can't see where to go, and you know, conditions are just too hard. And there was a lot of bad weather. We thought it was unusual, but actually it turned out to be quite normal. Then. You know, people started getting uh, gastrointestinal infection. In fact, we'd had them all, all through. Being, in, being inexperienced travellers in Asia, we all had tummy bugs. We had a pretty, a cook who was, uh, you know, had questionable, a local guy. He, his hygiene wasn't very good. Um, and of course, we had the usual, um, you know, colds that affect you uh, over there. And then half the expedition were professionals. You know, they, they worked for the CSR and things, and, and they, they really, they had families and jobs. They couldn't, you know, they didn't have an unlimited amount of time to try and climb this mountain. Because things were going so slowly, the weather didn't seem to be cooperating. Eventually, the, de the decision was made to pull the plug on the trip. That was really disappointing. Again, it was understandable, but I'd at least hoped to get to the end of the summit ridge, just to be able to look into Tibet. Anyway, it looked like it wasn't to be. But I had a plan because Lincoln and I by now were a little bit fitter than the rest of the team. We'd you know, probably been trying a bit harder. We'd had that epic on that uh, little climb we tried to, to do beforehand. So we volunteered to go up and bring down the fixed rope. And so I said to Lincoln, if it's a fine day, let's get up really early, get to the top of the fixed rope and just nick up to the end of the summit ridge to see what it's like. He said, yeah, okay. And, and, and then we said, well, you know, if it's really fine, you know, we could just think of having a go at the summit. You know, we'll just see what happens anyway. So, so it was a spectacularly fine day. So here we are, having climbed up the fixed rope, continued on to the end of the summit ridge. And we look along the summit ridge and think, yeah, yeah, let's go for it. Because, um, well, you know, we've done a multi-day climb in New Zealand, so why not do a multi-day one here? It's only, you know, you're not going to um, 
I mean, we, we were, the expedition was over, so we had nothing to lose as long as we didn't, of course, uh, make any mistakes. And uh, with that in mind, our strategy was to, well, we had it tied together by our rope, we'd shortened it, so it was about 10 metres between us. And the strategy was that if one of us slipped, the other would just jump off the other side of the ridge and, and the rope would hopefully snag. Well, Lincoln was a bit heavier than me, but anyway. Um, we continued along, it actually got, it's always harder than it looks, and it's always much further than it looks. It's like any big project, you know, there are unforeseen things along the way. Um, it always takes longer than you expect, and it's no different on a mountain. You know, the, the nice looking snow ridge turned out to be much steeper, the snow was deeper. Um, despite being deep snow, there was very, it's just soft powder. Underneath that soft powder was hard ice, it was slippery. And, you know, we were literally reduced to going very slowly. And by nightfall, we'd only gotten halfway along the ridge. It was, we didn't want to turn back. Uh, we thought, well, we're gonna, we're gonna bivvy. People have bivvied much higher. And um, so we stomped out an area in the snow. We, we just had the clothes that we, we wore. We didn't have a sleeping bag. Uh, we, we, we did have a down jacket each. Uh, that was it. And, um, well, we sat down for a very, very long night. As a last minute thing back in camp, I'd thrown a tin of John West cherries, we always give your sponsor a plug, um, as a treat. And uh, that's what we had for dinner. We were so inexperienced that we didn't have any stoves that worked really well at altitude. So we decided not to bring a stove, which was nearly a fatal mistake. Because the problem at altitude, I don't know if any of you have been, you know, had a training in science, but you know, the problem with altitude, as you go up in altitude, the air pressure gets less, and that's why there's less oxygen. And as the air pressure gets less, the, um, your body dehydrates more quickly, water evaporates more quickly, uh, plus you're breathing at three, three times the rate, four times the rate that you do down here. So you dry up very quickly, you dehydrate, and you've got to drink. You can't drink if you don't have a stove. Our water, water bottles are frozen, the syrupy juice surrounding the black cherries was nectar, but there wasn't much in it. Because I carried the can, I got the extra cherry, an un uneven number of cherries. It was a very long night. Anyway, we woke up shivering and vowed to keep, after having suffered so much, we, 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 we'd have to keep going. So we did in the face of a growing wind. About midday, Lincoln said he'd had enough. He said, look, if I keep going, I, I don't think I'll have the strength to get back again. So he, he, he just found a place out of the wind and fell asleep in the sun. I felt like doing the same thing, but I thought, no, no, I've got, you know, we're not going to get anywhere. If it, you know. So I raced up to the summit, getting there just in time to get a glimpse of Tibet, which was really exciting because I'd always had this vision of Tibet. It was forbidden land back then in the late 70s. So lovely brown rolling hills and total contrast to the deep gorges of the south. Turned my back on the summit, raced down, shook Lincoln awake. Um, and then, well, we had an epic. A storm came in, it was an electrical storm. It was, you know, we were actually discharging off our bodies. So it was very painful. There weren't, there weren't any lightning strikes on us but it was like having a coat that was like attached to an electric fence to get these shocks and um, eventually you know we were forced to be, just crawl along the ridge because the wind was so strong our eyelashes were freezing together we didn't have goggles we just had these glacier glasses which were useless the end of the day saw us still there and having to abseil down in the dark and, and, uh, anyway cut a long story short we did get back to our top camp <laughs> unfortunately Lincoln had sustained a bit of frostbite on the last few hours of the descent. The team was galvanised into action and um, they carried him down. And uh, a week later, he was airlifted out from base camp by the Indian Army. Now, we fully expected to have to pay for this uh, evacuation, but we never, well, the bill didn't arrive until 10 years later. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> of course, Lincoln had lost all his insurance details by then, but anyway, we, we paid it. <laughs> uh, the rest of us walked out, and here we are waiting for the bus in Rishikesh, which is at the foot of the hills, 49 degrees. <laughs> it's, it's, the contrast was unbearable. 
Despite Lincoln losing a couple of joints on his toes and a little bit off his fingers, it uh, wasn't enough to turn us off going to uh, that, the climbing in the greater ranges. It simply, um, you know, fired us, our ambition to do more climbing. It was such an exciting thing to do. It's a difficult thing to explain why I go through so much suffering. I mean, it is, it, it, it's plain hard work being at altitude, but the other side of the coin is it, it's just, it is the greatest challenge you can have. This is the greatest physical, physical challenge you can have. And it takes place in the most spectacular part of the planet. It really, especially if you love mountains, I mean, it's just, they're the ultimate mountains. And I found that, I, you know, I just wanted to go back. And so we went on a couple of smaller trips and then eventually in 1981, a friend invited us to join him on a climb of this iconic peak, <coughs> which is just south of Mount Everest. It's called Amma de Blam. It's, um, there's Everest there with the Lhotse Wall in front of it, the village of Namshu Bazaar here, where it's a sort of Sherpa, all this area is known as the Kumbu, which is the Sherpa homeland. And back in 81, Amma de Blam only had a couple of ascents and we were trying the North Ridge, which is here. That's Amma de Blam there, facing the, the shot on Island, the Trekking Peak called Island Peak. At this uh, Amma de Blam had only had a couple of ascents from this side, so still quite a challenging uh, route to do, very steep. <coughs> Ideally, we would have done it Alpine style, and when you do it Alpine style, it's like what we climb, the way we climb Mount Cook. You just put a few days' worth of food, fuel in your backpack, and, and you head off. And when you get to uh, nightfall, you find somewhere to spend the night, and next morning you keep going. That's the ideal way to climb a mountain, but uh, as we discovered on Dunagiri, sometimes at altitude you have to um, compromise. On Amma de Blam, still relatively inexperienced, we, we decided to fix a bit of rope, so we fixed a bit, probably a little bit more than half the route. Really exciting climbing. All the time over my shoulder, or over our shoulder, was Everest, peeking its head over the, the, the south face of Lhotse. Until then, I hadn't remotely considered myself an Everest climber, or I had no ambition to go to Everest. I never thought I'd get the opportunity because Everest was so expensive, and I wasn't that interested being an arrogant youth. I thought, no, nah, it's not, you know, Everest is a, not really a real climber's mountain, you know. You've got to have, go there with lots of big, vast pyramid of um, infrastructure to get one or two people to the top and you know you're, you're paying local people to be guides and dangerous situations and blah 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 i really you know just wasn't on my radar but having it there over my shoulder all the time for three weeks i couldn't help wondering what it's like up there <laughs> that's what it's like with mountain you know? what's it like up there and then i sort of started dreaming wouldn't it be wouldn't it be nice or wouldn't it be great if you know, to climb everest properly to do it alpine style, without oxygen, no Sherpa support, via a new route. Part, total pipe dream. Continue climbing out of the Blams. It was, it was a fun climb. It was you know, quite challenging along the way. Um, this is our last camp. Oh, second last camp. Then we're inside the tent there. And then we had a snow cave further up. Eventually, um, after three weeks, off and on climbing. Lincoln, Andy Henderson, who joined us on this climb, and myself found ourselves on the summit. Um, at, the, at this point, I just uh, lost one of our main incentives for the day, a big family-sized block of Cadbury chocolate. Lincoln had, um, I pulled it out of my pack and given it to Lincoln to, um, to, to split up while I pulled out a, another treat, which was my mother's fruitcake. <laughs> oh some of my mother's fruit cakes were reserved for the summit. And uh, Lincoln absentmindedly put the block of, snow, block of chocolate down on the snow, thinking it was flat. Had a little bit of an angle to it, and off it shot. <laughs> anyway, so, you know, Everest. Back then, Everest was still, had some mystery about it. Not much was known about the north side, because it had been closed, only just opened, a, um, the year prior, the Chinese had, cl had it closed since, well, since um, before the Chinese took over Tibet. 
This is actually a shot taken by NASA from the International Space Station. And that is Everest. That's the north face of Everest. Amma de Blam is somewhere in this forest of peaks here. There. <clears throat> so Everest is, you know, the, Nepal, Nepal is all this side. This is all Tibet. And the north side of Everest was, well, as I said, not much was known about it. Back in Kathmandu after Amma de Blam, I met a Japanese man who'd just come back from the north side of Everest. And the Japanese had actually made uh, one of the early ascents of the North Face from the bottom. And he was telling me that, yeah, the North Face, it's very direct, very direct. I was saying, yeah. Looking at photos, not very good ones, I thought, yeah, it is very direct. Because all the information until then was only from prior uh, pre-war expeditions where the British had, uh, had tried on about four different occasions, five different occasions, to try and climb the North Ridge of the mountain. And then, of course, Tibet was closed and, um, um, you know, then attempts were made from the south, eventually succeeding in the 1953 British climb. But the North Face was still a bit of a mystery. Later that year, 1981, uh, this Everest is over here in Nepal, I uh, got the opportunity to go to the northeastern edge of the Tibetan plateau in Qinghai province. That, that blue mark there is Lake Koko Noor. And beyond Lake Koko Noor to the south uh, is a, an isolated range of mountains called the Anyamachan Range. And we got permission to go and climb a 6,000 metre peak there, which was, that was very exciting. Back then in 81 to go to China, it was quite exotic. Uh, along, as, long as, as well as Lincoln and, and Andy, there's a chap called Jeff Bartram who joined us. And, you know, we spent quite a bit of time just getting acclimatised, waiting for the weather and so on. And during that time, sort of quite a lot of idle time, I started talking to our Chinese minders, finding out a bit more about the north face of Everest, because by now I thought, well, you know, an Australian's going to have to climb Everest sooner or later. Why not us? You know, um, but how and when? Well, I wasn't really interested in just doing the normal thing. I, I really did want to do a new route. It may have been a little bit presumptuous, but, but again, why not? And having talked to the Japanese guys, well, well, the North Face, that, that, that will, that's definitely, there's an opportunity there. Um, and inquiring to our Chinese minder, he said he'd find out. So <laughs> we had a, a radio crew with us, they had a valve radio, and they would communicate with Beijing via Morse code. This is 1981. Anyway, they found out that uh, the North Face of Everest was actually available to climb in the, 1980, in the autumn of 1984. So back then, the, the governments that had control of Everest were sensible. They only allowed one expedition on any particular part of the mountain. So, you know, they considered the North Face as being one part of the mountain. So the French expedition had, had booked and they cancelled. So I said, OK, we'll take a gamble. We'll, 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 we'll book it. We had to fork out $2,000, which was all we could afford amongst the, the four of us. I convinced the others that, you know, it'd be okay. Anyway, we went ahead and climbed Anyamachan and uh, three weeks of traveling for three days of climbing, but we, we got the permission for Everest. Well, it's, I mean, that was the easy part. Of course, there were two very big uncertainties. One was our level of experience, and two, how, the, how on earth could we afford to pay it? The Chinese gave us an estimated budget $150,000. Well, if you really want to do something, you know, you, you can try hard and you might do it. So, uh, well, the first thing was experience. I'd already had my eye on, on this peak here, which is called Annapurna 2 in, in central Nepal. Um, I'd found out that it was, it had repelled several expeditions. We went in there in the autumn of 1983, a year prior to Everest. And all well, just getting to base camp it was <coughs> trekking in during the monsoon, really exciting, um, having to build bridges, fend off leeches, collecting bamboo shoots from the, just everything growing out of, it was just, the verdant growth was incredible. Our base camp was only two, two and a half thousand metres above sea level, you know, in the temperate rainforest. And from here we had to climb up this steep vegetated gorge, uh, a couple of weeks just getting up to a place where we could uh, 
call a you know, proper base camp, an advanced base camp, and uh, you know, working hard for two weeks, just lugging all our loads up here, and then starting to climb proper from four and a half thousand metres upwards. Um, first a big cliff, and then a see, and then onto a snowfield, which was um, on the edge of the cliff, and then up the diagonal snowfield to um, a high camp where we could, you know, have, have a snow cave, step out of the snow cave, and look down at the temperate rainforest, really just down there. It's the most I challenge you to find anywhere that's more spectacular in a change in, in conditions on, on the planet. Here you are in Arctic conditions looking down at, at temperate rainforest. And you know, the route continued because it's the, you know, the, the Annapurna range is really, um, it's got no high foothills in front of it to stop the moisture. So it gets a lot of rain, over three meters a year and all falls during the monsoon. So we had massive snowfalls which caused big avalanche problems. Lincoln, you know, he's a bit, tended to be a bit accident prone, poor old Lincoln, so he, he broke a bone in his foot. Um, anyway, we continue on and set up the route for the last bit, which was, unfortunately, this here, this, this turned into a major trap. This whole snowfield, which, I mean, it's a neve, so it's ice, is supposed to be moving away from us. But for some reason, during the, because of the big snowfall, it, it slipped sideways and started dumping masses of ice down our cliff, uh, route up the cliff, so um, that became really quite a, some, uh, an area of great objective hazard. Had a big rest and then <coughs> tried to climb the final summit pyramid. We were thwarted by strong cold winds, spent a week in the snow cave until we started running out of food and, and made a decision to turn back. And just as we made the decision, the weather cleared and we, we made one last desperate attempt for the summit, spending two nights on this little ledge. We, we managed to find a little bit of snow in the back of the chimney, enough to, to ha hack out a couple of ledges to sit on. Spent a whole day trying to climb the cliff above and then eventually found ourselves on top. I mean, uh, if I look back on all my climbs, I think Annapurna 2 is probably the one, the greatest sense of achievement, just because of our level of experience, which wasn't great and the, just the amount of um, perseverance and setbacks that we had. And they continued after the summit because the weather came in ferociously, a uh, massive snowstorm, and by now we'd run totally out of food. We'd been up high so long that we really had to keep going, otherwise we're gonna just run out of, run out of steam. And uh, by, the, by the time we got back to advanced base, we were right at the end of our tether. And, um, but, it was the case for the last five days where um, we'd wake up in the morning and wonder whether we we're going to be alive at the end of the day. We really, you know, just, you know, it was touch and go. And so here, so Greg Mortimer, who joined us on this climb, with Andy and uh, Lincoln, uh, in the tent, on the first morning that we woke up and think, we made it, we're going to survive the route up behind there. Back home, we'd been reported as missing. <laughs> Actually, not good for our families, but good PR for um, yeah, Greg showing off his high altitude physiology. Good, good PR for um, going to raising money for Everest. Back down in the valley, the locals overjoyed to see seeing us alive and uh, very, very kind to us. Anyway, on the basis of our notoriety on Annapurna 2, we managed to get sponsorship from Channel 9, Kerry Packer. So. Um, we became a wide world of sport, Everest expedition. Um, I mean, we, it was a bit of a con on our part. We, you know, was, you know, Kerry Packer was a gambler, but I tell you what, this is one, one of his bigger gambles. I like, you know, a couple of hundred grand. What's that to him? Anyway, he he he, he sponsored us, so so we had the means to get our expedition together, headed over there. Um, he even uh, was generous enough to pay for a couple of our Nepali friends to come over as base camp staff. All the, bit, all the travel was a bit much for them. On the train to Beijing, we flew into Lhasa, and then from Lhasa, um, we headed westwards for the 700 odd kilometers. Uh, first by bus until we got to the swollen Yaling Sangpo River, where the ferry was out of order. So uh, we managed to get a couple of locals to help us get across in their Yakskin coracles. Then we got an army truck 
and continued on our way to base camp. The Chinese built a road to base camp, so you can actually drive to the north side of Everest. Um, good and bad thing to do that. Obviously, you're not very acclimatised, so you have to take it pretty easy for the first uh, couple of weeks. But you know, base camp's like nearly 18, 18 kilometres away from the foot of the mountain, so you spend quite a bit of time getting all your stuff close to the mountain, first with the help of yaks, and then by carrying on your back. So we had an advanced base here, and we're still five kilometres away from the foot of the mountain, so we basically had to lug our, the rest of our, our stuff up to here on foot. So this is the north face, and the, dare, the closest we dared camp was here, still three kilometres from the base of the mountain. And you can see why, um, well, here we're heading, we headed across to this saddle because we wanted to see into Nepal. It was a bit of an acclimatisation thing, so I brought skis for those people who could ski, so we skied across to that pass, which is called the Lola. And one of the reasons, other reasons was to see if we could locate some of our friends. There was actually an expedition, mainly from Melbourne, <laughs> in, um, comprising of Peter Hillary, John Muir, um, Craig Nottle, and Kim Logan and Fred Fromm, who were an, an alternate Antipodean expedition to Everest. And it, kind of, it was a bit of a race, but it wasn't really a race. But anyway, uh, they'd nicknamed themselves the Turkey Patrol, and they'd nicknamed us the A-Team. So uh, getting here, we could see with our binoculars or our telephoto lens, we could see the camp in the Western Coombe. So in unison, we yelled out, Turkey Patrol, and you know, not expecting anything. Anyway, there wasn't anything. But then, then we heard it. A-team. A-team was echoed. It was incredible. I mean, it was a long way away. That was exciting. But here we are camped here, three kilometres away from the north face. This is the north face. From here to here, vertically, is three kilometres. The scale is very intimidating. But most intimidating of all is a massive amphitheatre that you're in is all surrounded by these big walls that are heavily laden in monsoon snow. And you can see the avalanche debris there. We knew that this is a place that you didn't uh, go to in any but perfect conditions. If it snowed, you had to stay away for a while. And the first thing we had to do was work out where to go. You know, there's no guidebook for it. That's the beauty of climbing a new route. After a lot of deliberation, we worked out a route we thought was safe, but we figured out that maybe we should compromise our alpine style thing by fixing the first bit, which seemed very dangerous, but it was, only, it was really the only option we had to do a new route, we thought. So our plan was to fix, get all the rope we had just to fix the line up here, because there was a spur jutting out from the face. So rather than lug all our gear back down three kilometres to camp, we found what we thought was a safe place to leave our gear, and which was here, and then we started fixing rope. Tedious business, but we thought, you know, better be safe than sorry. And so we'd spend a few hours every day fixing a bit of rope. The snow weather would come in, we'd head back down. Those of us who ski, skied back down, which was then became, you know, that was the nice part of the day. After a couple of days of doing this, there was a big storm, dropped a lot of snow, uh, well, our, basically our advance base got a bit flooded. We had to wait down here for several days for the uh, snow to clear off the mountain before we headed back up again to discover that uh, um, there had actually been avalanches down uh, fixed rope, down bits of it. And, but more concerningly was our gear dump looked exactly the same, but we couldn't find our gear. We dug for two days. Nothing. We'd lost our boots, our crampons, our ice axe, our helmets, our harnesses, bits of other pieces of other stuff. It just wasn't there. It was only later that I realised that the you know, snow had fallen in here, just drifted down off the mountain. There was no avalanche, but you know there was sort of snow sloughing off. And although it looked exactly the same as when we'd left it, this here is a glacier. Over here is this crack. That's where the glacier separates from the mountain. It's the Bergschrund. Now, we found out later from a German glaciological team that this glacier 
could move up to three metres a day. We'd been away since the storm for five days, so that <coughs> theoretically could have been could have moved 15 metres away. Why wasn't there a 15 metre gap? Well, because the snow was coming off the mountain and filling that gap. We were digging in the wrong place. Anyway, that's the benefit of hindsight. We'd lost all our gear. Luckily, there was a film crew whose job was to film us from the bottom of the mountain. They had to do a bit of glacier travel, so they had been equipped with crampons and ice axes and boots. Not as good as what we'd lost, but good enough. The only problem with my feet, I've got size 12 feet, no one else had size 12 feet. So I had to, well, I had to give up climbing or adapt my cross-country ski boots as climbing boots, which I did in the great tradition of Australians being innovative and, you know, making do with what you've got on hand. It worked okay. I did find on steep ice, though, uh, such as here, that my feet would slip out of my boots, quite disconcerting. Anyway, um, we were forced to make a, a temporary camp. We were, we were desperately looking for a camp too. Anyway, we couldn't find a good spot, so we call this 1.8. But it enabled us to climb up through the most difficult part of the route, which was this band of rock, before it gave us access to a spur jutting out from the face. Um, wasn't it? This was 1.8, terrible place for a camp. You can see it's got hit, hammered by spindrift. Unfortunately, um, the day that Greg was climbing up through the, that steep section, he so absorbed in his climbing, he left, forgot to put his sunglasses on when the sun came up, and he got quite bad snow blindness. So I was helping Greg up to um, up to the net, well, proper camp too, when we were sending the fixed ropes, and uh, I was actually relieving myself. So I detached myself from the fixed rope, gone around the corner a bit, and I was enjoying the view, and you know. I was about to get back on the fixed rope when I heard a muffled roar. And I looked to either side, nothing. I looked up and I thought, it, it, it was an avalanche and it was a big one. And, you know, I thought we'd be safe from avalanches, but this was such a, because beside me was this massive gully, which all the avalanches tend to get funneled into. But this was such a big avalanche that it got, um, as a, Funnel, it jumped out of that funnel of the, of the Great Couloir, and I just had enough time to lurch over to the rope, hang on, and you know, for about a minute I was pummeled by this incredible force, fully expecting to be swept off by a big lump of ice or rock. It never came, and suddenly you know, I was in clear, clear air again, but every crevice of a um, bit of clothing in fact, I had to get totally undressed and shake everything out. And I found myself just there, naked in the sun, drying out, shivering like a leaf. It wasn't because I was cold, it was because I was, I'd been so frightened by it. Luckily, Greg has survived too. Back up at the snow cave, um, where I left Lincoln to dig a snow cave, he'd um, told us that it was okay. So it was, it was a lucky um, lucky escape. But it did, did prove this, um, this little foothold we had on the mountain in the snow cave place for the snow cave was actually pretty safe. And so we spent a few nights here getting acclimatised before heading back down to, uh, well, rest, because we really only had a foothold on the mountain. And now the serious part of the climb was coming up where we needed to climb two, the next two thirds and we had to be rested and, and recuperated. We also needed good weather. Now. This is the most frustrating time of any expedition. We'd had enough experience now to know that timing is everything. And back then, we had no communication devices, satellite phones, no weather information. We did have a shortwave radio where we could get the information about the wind direction, the strength, and the temperature at different altitudes, that's all. And, and for a couple of weeks, we just had to wait for the right conditions to come along. Very frustrating, because you know you're running out of time. Winter's coming, um, you haven't got forever. Uh, is there gonna be a break in the weather? Are you gonna have wasted all your opportunity? And it, in these situations, it really, you know, you just gotta be patient, try and keep your morale up. Um, having Naran and Tenzing, our two Nepalis, were very useful for that, because they, they were fantastic um, for them to sort of take care of the catering, looking after us very well but it's really frustrating. And, and then now you're starting getting homesick. So, you know, it's very tempting to give up 
You know, we're just two thirds, we've got two thirds of the mountain to go. The hardest two thirds physically. We had a couple of false starts, but luckily we managed to keep ourselves psychologically motivated so that for, on the third attempt, uh, we still had, um, well, we still had that fire in us to maybe we can do it. It's, it's only a maybe, there's still a lot of uncertainty. This is Jeff emptying his pee bottle. <laughs> there's a, this is in the snow cave, it's actually got a bit of a crack in the back of it, so it's perfect for liquid waste. Um, you know, it's hard work getting out of a sleeping bag, going outside, so we reserve that for number twos, but um, anyway. <laughs> so the weather looked like it was stable, and uh, well, we headed up into the unknown. Now we were, we left the fixed rope behind, and we decided we were going to climb unroped. It was just no way we could climb that distance in the little time we had to be roped up would just slow us down too much. And it was here that Jeff made the very sensible decision to turn back. He got a weird headache. He thought, no, nah, this is not right. While I'm still on the fixed rope, I'm going to go down. And it was a very unselfish decision, because if he'd gone higher just to see, you know, we'd have to, some of us would have had to have helped him down. So th we're now four of us, Greg, Lincoln, Andy and myself. We managed to find a, a great spot for the first night above our snow cave, actually just a crevasse, which is sort of a horizontal crevasse. So very little effort for good shelter. And the next morning we continued up this uh, interminable seeming slope. I mean, you do maximum 20 steps. I, I like going a long way before I stop and have a rest. This was just, I could only do 20 before just collapsing in my ice axe, heaving. On this sort of terrain, you've got to be careful. Uh, there's, there's no room for mistakes uh, because it's quite hard. It's icy. There's an icy skin on the snow. It's very good, easy climbing, but if you trip, if you catch your cramp on tip on your trouser leg, which is an easy thing to do, and trip over, you're dead, basically. You ca if you fall over, if you get off your crampons, even if you sit down without stomping out a platform or digging out with the ice axe, you'll, you'll just keep sliding. And then once you start sliding, there's no way you can stop yourself. So, you know, paying attention, eventually, towards the end of the day, had to dig out a ledge, put our tent up, and then a very, very long night of uncertainty and excitement. <laughs> Lincoln took this photo the next day. He actually, when the rest of us went for the summit, he stayed back because he'd, he'd uh, decided he'd had enough, didn't want to get frostbite, and he took this photo of his feet. And um, once I, a, a primary school kid asked me how we got the horses up here. <laughs> so we, we were here. We come all the way up, and a third of the mountain below here, first day to here, second day to here. So we still had a fair way to go on our last, well, this is going to be our last day. No way we had any more time. <sighs> Desperate to get in the sun, I cut out right and um, got some horrible rock, threw, threw a rope down to Greg. He came up on the rope and uh, no sign of Lincoln or Andy. Eventually, shouting, we found out that Lincoln had turned back. He'd gone back to our tent, as you can see over here. And then Andy came up and complaining of his crampon having been broken. So we stopped to try to tie it together and then continued on. You know, by this stage, it was, no, we were starting to think, no, we're not going to do it. It's two o'clock in the afternoon and we're only here. You know, you can't see the top of the mountain. So he said, OK, let's, let's go to four o'clock. And then four o'clock, of course, came along. We're still nowhere near the sun. I said, OK. I think we'd be, I've got, I've got a torch, I've got spare batteries. For three of us, that should be okay. Let's go till it gets dark. So right on sunset, I find myself topping out over the, not quite on the summit, but first time looking down to Amateur Blam. I remember three years before sitting, oh, being on Amateur Blam and wondering whether it was possible. This is just a short video clip here from our film. Even through the telescopic line. lens, the climbers look like ants. But a recovered Jeff saw enough to know someone was in trouble. It was Lincoln. A heart-shattering decision, but the only one he could make. Until I started to come down, and I just decided that my my pace was too slow, and that was further sort of slowed down by a few cosmic bits here and there. So I just thought I'd have no chance. 
But yeah, well, maybe I'd get there today, but there's no way I'd get back. <coughs> and uh, not being prepared for a bivvy, uh, well, it would definitely be frostbite country up there. I think if anyone has to spend the night out. The script is Only three left. left. The day is nearly over. Just a few hours of daylight left. Conditions are inconceivable, and Lorraine's worried. But not today, though. I think only tomorrow. Yeah? Yeah, already too late. Now, they're going to make it up today. Today? Yeah. Uh -huh. They're getting... They, they're cracking the final rock barrier. They've got two to three and a half hours sunlight left. Uh -huh. And once they're through this rock barrier, and they're all going quite strongly, even Andy is catching up now. They're going to, uh, they've got an easy walk, easy walk to the summit ridge. Nothing's easy up here, but Tim's climbing strongly. His pack with all his survival equipment back at Camp 4. The cold is intense, deep, bitter, and nagging. The sun's just about to set. Andy's broken his crampon, two choices. Fix the crampon or die. But to fix the crampon, the gloves must come off and the fingers will be frostbitten. Decision? Take off the gloves and fix the crampon. And so, 50 meters from the summit, Andy Henderson takes a decision that saves his life, destroys his hands, and ruins his summer chance. There. I can just see him going. Boy, they're so close to the summit. Only Greg and Tim left, and the sun is setting on the world. It's hard to believe I'm near the top of Mount Everest. It was an amazing sunset, I must say. I've, I've never, ever experienced such a, an incredible vision because there's literally every colour of the rainbow in, in the scene before us. And, you know, there's, there's always a sense of euphoria when you get to the top, no more up. And it's just this relief which floods you, particularly on a climb like this where it was an uncertain thing right until the last few minutes. But on top of that euphoria, you very quickly impose the discipline because you know that you're only halfway and there's no point in getting to the top unless you get down, back down again. And that's weighing very heavily on your mind, especially as it's about to get dark. <laughs> so we turned our backs on the summit, caught up with Andy about, um, he was literally about there. He'd almost made it, but it was dark. Um, he asked me to give him a hand to change his glasses because he wears prescription and lenses, and I realised that his hands were frozen solid. Anyway, luckily they were frozen in the shape of holding his ice axe. So we descended slightly differently where we descended and uh, got back to our tent about 3 a.m. where Lincoln was pretty happy to see us. We were very happy to see him because he had uh, a billy on the boil, so we were able to slake our thirst, which was considerable. And uh, to cut a long story short, over the next couple of days, we all got off the mountain safely. Here, Jim, the doctor, is, um, well, he's prescribing some medicinal alcohol, Randy, and single malt. It's okay now, because um, 
It's actually, it is a vasodilator, but Andy's fingers were um, pretty badly frostbitten. He ended up losing two joints on all his fingers, plus one thumb. But um, I think that, that in many ways the, the, the perfect climb, apart from Andy's frostbite, because uh, you know, the style was good, it was uncertain till the end, and the teamwork was, uh, you know, it was just every, everyone worked very well as a team, and the, the outcome was um, great, apart from Andy's fingers. Tragically, the other expedition, the Turkey Patrol, um, the outcome was quite different, and we, that was uh, their, the tragic outcome was kind of clouded our success. We found out the news when we were back in Lhasa that uh, Craig Nottle and Fred Fromm had, in separate incidents, had fallen to their deaths. So um, that was very unfortunate. But you know, just goes to um, I suppose highlight the, the the fine margin that you operate at at altitude and just how how careful you have to be. Anyway, um, <clears throat> it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I just finish off by saying that um, you know I wish that the the status of teachers in our community was uh, what it used to be, and, and hopefully one day we'll get back up to what it used to be, uh, because um, you know you you have the future in your hands and. Uh, it's an incredibly responsible role. I've just been in Nepal, and there, although they don't get paid very much, they're still a bit more traditional in their regard for the for education, and, and so teachers are often the most important person in the village. Anyway, uh, all the best, and thank you very much.